Hello and welcome to Turner Classic Movies. I'm Ben Mankiewicz. Today is February 28th, 2021. It is Zero Mostel's birthday. He would have been 106 years old today. We're going to celebrate with a double feature of his films and joining me, an old friend of Zero's, another actor, Jim Brochu. Jim, thanks for being here. Hey, Ben, it's my pleasure. It's great to see you again. Yes, you as well. Now, Jim is not just an actor. Uh, Jim wrote and starred in a play that toured the country over 800 performances over 13 years called Zero Hour about the force of nature that was Zero Mostel. Jim, what drew you to Zero? Well, you're right, Ben. He actually was a force of nature. I was a sophomore in high school when I first met Zero. My dad was a friend of an actor named David Burns, and Davey was appearing in A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. So that show opened on May 8th, and I saw the show on May 11th. Sitting in the front row, I had no idea what a Zero Mostel was. <laughs> Never heard the name before. And I sat there, the curtain went up, he came out, Ben, it was like somebody stepped on the accelerator, and I just went back in my seat. He was amazing. He, he was out there for two and a half hours and one of the funniest men I'd ever seen in one of the funniest shows I'd ever seen with the great character men like Jack Guilford and Davey and John Carradine. So we always went backstage afterwards and my dad went up the stairs to uh, Davey Burns dressing room, but I always had to take a peek out onto the stage. Now, I was going to military school, so I had a West Point kind of uh, outfit on with my little cap, a fat kid in a military uniform. You can imagine what that looked like. So dad went upstairs and I went out to the stage and smack, I ran right into Zero Mostel. And he still had his costume on and it was like he was just getting out of the shower. That costume, Ben, was soaking wet. And he looked at me in my uniform and he said, who are you, General Nuisance? And I, I, I uh, uh, Mr. I, I didn't, uh, blah, blah, blah. didn't know what to say. What are you doing here? I said, well, I came to see my friend Davy Burns. He said, well, you never come to see me. Why don't you come to see me? I said, I will. I, I promise I will. So the next week I was off from school again and I had to see Forum one more time. And I went back to see Zero. Well, there he was in front of his dressing room screaming at one of the actors who had done something foul to him. And uh, I, I mean, it, he was a volcano. And I stood there just quaking watching this. Finally, he was finished with the actor. He turned to me and he said, Sergeant Brochu, you did come to see me. Please come in. And I sat in his dressing room, still quaking and uh, just admiring him. And I knew at that point I was gonna take on a lot of his characteristics. I was heavy, I could move well. And even in high school, they called me the Zero Mostel of LaSalle. Man, there's so many questions I want to get to. First, I want to tell people the double feature we have of Zero Mostel films tonight uh, begins with his uh, first uh, Hollywood film, Duberry Was a Lady, with the great uh, Lucille Ball and uh, Gene Kelly, and then ends with a very personal picture uh, for him, uh, The Front, uh, about the uh, Hollywood blacklist and, and Zero was blacklisted. What did Hollywood think they had uh, when uh, Zero is brought out from New York uh, to Hollywood? By Louis B. Mayer, right? By MGM. Well, Zero's rise was absolutely meteoric. He made his debut at Cafe Society on December the 28th, 1941, about three weeks after Pearl Harbor. And he was making $450 a week. He had started out just giving lectures at union halls about art. And the lectures were filled with jokes. The jokes turns into benefits. And then the benefit turned into Cafe Society where he was discovered. Then he got a job on the radio Louis B. Mayer heard him on the radio. Then he went to Broadway uh, in a show called Keep Him Laughing. Everybody in Hollywood wanted this guy. He was, as they say, hot. And Mayer wanted him more than anybody else and signed him to a seven-year contract, $3,000 a week. But Zero was not the type to be contained within a, a picture. And he was also disappointed when he got to Hollywood that he thought he was being brought out there to be an actor. But what Mayer wanted was his nightclub act. But then he started to uh, 
act up with his social causes, and he really got on the wrong side of Louis B. Mayer very quickly. But you see his nightclub act almost verbatim at the beginning of the picture. There was no Rami the Swami in the original Du Barry Was a Lady. They created that part for him specifically to do his nightclub act. Jim, great stuff. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ben. Here's the film from 1943. Lucille Ball, Red Skelton, Gene Kelly, and Zero Mostel in Du Barry Was a Lady. Welcome back. I'm Ben Mankiewicz, joined once again by Jim Brochu. Jim, nice to see you again. Thank you, Ben. Great to see you. It's one thing to be a fan of Zero, and you got to know him. You got to be friendly with him. What did you see in him where you thought, oh, man, I want to I want to play this guy on stage. I want to bring the, the, again, I'll use the phrase, the force of nature that is Zero Mostel to audiences all over the country, who many of whom I presume had, of course, never seen him live. So when I became an actor, I, I was walking up Broadway one day, and here comes Zero. And I, I rushed up to him, I said, Z, I'm an actor. He said, I'll be the judge of that. And I said, well, you can be the judge of that because I'm doing a play down at the Cherry Lane Theater and I want, you, I want you to come see it. He said, I'd rather have hot needles poked in my eyes. I said, well, I'm mad at you. Why are you mad at me? I said, years ago, you promised me an autographed picture and you never gave it to me. And there, Ben, at the corner of 50th Street and Broadway in front of the Winter Garden Theater, Zero Mostel looked at me and said, you're not worthy, and walked away. <laughs> but two nights later, I got to the theater and there was my autographed picture to Jimmy with my admiration from Zero. He could have said, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry, give me your address, and he could have sent you the, the photo. Better to say, you're not worthy, and you're walk not off. Worthy. It's good, <laughs> right? Yeah, he, he always had an exit line, and it was a good one. One of the reasons that I wrote Zero Hour is because a great drama is made of uh, people overcoming great obstacles. And Zero had huge obstacles in his life. Louis B. Mayer was so angry with him that he had uh, his part cut in Du Barry and also in another film he was shooting at the same time called Tennessee Johnson. Just to bring people up to date, Tennessee Johnson was a MGM film about the impeachment of Andrew Johnson where uh, Johnson's uh, racism was not just softened but uh, eradicated uh, from the film. Yes, quite whitewashed and Zero was uh, very upset about that and he actually started a petition to have the uh, picture shelved. That's not even the, the last straw that, that broke the mostel mayor relationship. Oh no. The final insult came when Mayer was having a party to show Zero off and he hired the, uh, he was at the Hillcrest Country Club and every one of the major MGM stars came to see Zero Mostel. Well, Zero thought he was being invited to be a guest. And when he found out he was the entertainment he was absolutely furious. So the, uh, the limousine was sent for him and there was no zero. And uh, they found out he actually went down to Long Beach and gave a performance to raise money for the International Longshoremen's Union, which was a left wing organization. And Zero knew he was in trouble when he got back to the studio on Monday and Arthur Freed, the great producer, greeted him by saying, good morning, comrade. And it was at that point, Mayer said, I'm done. Jim, great information. Thanks very much. My pleasure, Ben. Stick around. Jim and I will be back momentarily with another Zero Mostel film, also starring Woody Allen. It's Martin Ritz, The Front. Stay with us. Hello, I'm Ben Mankiewicz. Welcome to Turner Classic Movies. You've joined us for the back half of our double feature of Zero Mostel films. We began with Du Barry Was a Lady from 1943, his first, and we end with The Front from 1976, his final film. And joining us, a friend of Zero's, Jim Brochu. Jim, thanks for being here. It is my great pleasure, Ben. Thank you for having me. Jim is not only a friend of Zero's, he also played Zero in a play he also wrote, Zero Hour. 800 plus performances touring the country over 13 years, a number of awards, very well received play. 
Jim, tell me how you structured the play Zero Hour and how that ties in uh, to the movie that we have coming up here, The Front from 1976, uh, about the blacklist. Well, the play itself takes place in his uh, painting studio on West 28th Street, and an unseen interviewer comes from the New York Times to talk about his life. And Zero talks about all the things that had happened with his family, with his career, but he gets to the blacklist and he takes things very, very seriously. And I recreate about 10 minutes of his House uh, Un-American Activities Committee testimony in front of Jay Parnell Thomas, who was the uh, chairman of the committee. Is Zero your given name? No, sir. Zero is a nickname. It represents the amount of money I've been making over the last few years <laughs> since your investigation began. His testimony lasted well over three hours, and some of the things that Jay Parnell Thomas, who was the chairman of the committee, asked him was about his nightclub act and if it was subversive in any way, and why he was uh, using his comedic talents to raise money for these left causes. And Zero said, I would do the same thing for uh, the Heart Association or the Cancer Association. I use my talents to help other people. And Thomas said, well, what kind of uh, stuff do you do? He said, well, I imitate a teapot and I also do an imitation of a butterfly at rest. To which Thomas said, well, is your imitation of a butterfly at rest funny? Zero said, on that I'll take the fifth. The next day in the paper, all it said was, Mostel takes the fifth. He talks to the committee for three hours. He's funny, he's charming, but in the end, he's blacklisted. At the end, he's blacklisted. Yeah, people just, uh, uh, he wouldn't get any jobs on television or in films. And uh, so once again, he returned to the stage where he perfected his craft. And then uh, Burgess Meredith, who had also been blacklisted, uh, got a bunch of actors together to do a production of Ulysses in Nighttown off Broadway. And it became such a hit that eventually it moved to Broadway. So they, they did something for themselves. They said, we're not going to let the people who blacklisted us keep us down. So this movie then, The Front, where Zero plays uh, essentially a version of himself. Obviously, it must have been very personal. He wasn't just thinking about himself. He was thinking about all those friends, all those colleagues who were blacklisted. Well, Hecky Brown, who Zero plays, is a composite of himself and his best friend, Phil Loeb. He was a marvelous character actor. He played Molly Goldberg's husband on The Goldbergs, but he was listed as a left-wing person. And the uh, sponsors of the Goldberg said, well, it's either him going or the show going. And Gertrude Berg, who was a great friend of Phil Loeb's, who loved him as her husband, Jake, had to make a decision and she wanted to save the show. So Phil was fired. He had a special needs son and he wasn't able to make money for the son. He lost his house. He lost his uh, income. And he actually moved in with Kate and Zero Mostel. Woody Allen is the star of the front. He plays the cashier who fronts for these blacklisted writers. It's certainly at this time, 1976, it's the only time you're gonna see Woody Allen in a movie that he is not directing and didn't write the screenplay, but I think he's quite good. He also bears a resemblance to Walter Bernstein, which is one of the reasons that uh, Bernstein wanted him in the film. Yes. but. Uh, there was trouble when uh, the film was released because people are saying, oh, Woody Allen, oh, Zero Mostel. This is going to be a crazy, wonderful comedy. Even David Beagleman, who was running Columbia Pictures at the time, when, when he had the picture uh, screened, he was stunned afterwards. And he said, I thought this was supposed to be funny. You know, it's a very serious picture. There's humor in it. But, uh, you know, it reflects about what happened to these people and how their lives were destroyed by this craziness that went on. Jim, great information. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Ben. Here's the movie, the final film of Zero Mostel's great career from 1976, directed by Martin Ritt, written by Walter Bernstein, The Front. Welcome back. I'm Ben Mankiewicz, joined once again by Jim Brochu, a longtime friend of uh, Zero Mostel's Played Zero in Zero Hour, a play that uh, Jim also wrote. Uh, once again, Jim, thanks for being here. Oh, Ben, it's my great pleasure to be with you.
you mentioned before the movie that the part was a, a, a mixture of uh, Zero's own experiences with the blacklist and those of his uh, best friend, Philip Loeb. Uh, uh, Philip Loeb uh, killed himself. He did. He was living with Kate and Zero at the time. And it was uh, Labor Day weekend of 1955. And uh, Kate gave him his breakfast. Uh, Phil said, I'm going to go for a walk. He put on his coat. He checked into the Taft Hotel and he took a bottle of sleeping pills. And that was the end of his life. And again, Philip Loeb, special needs uh, child, uh, a family uh, that he just uh, was not able to provide for uh, suddenly, all because of uh, meetings and marches that he had attended uh, years earlier that had absolutely nothing to do with undermining the government of the United States of America. No, they all thought they were doing some social good. Zero used to say he knew, everybody knew that the government of the United States was not going to be a socialist government, but they all felt that the government could help out a little bit. So Zero died of a heart attack uh, before he was uh, set to uh, go on stage uh, uh, for a play, uh, The Merchant in Philadelphia. Um, uh, died young, just 62 years old, but uh, this film we just saw, uh, The Front, is a, is a good coda for an all too brief career. Yeah, Zero died nine months after the uh, film was released. As you said, he was doing this play called The Merchant, which was a rethinking of The Merchant of Venice written by Arnold Wesker, uh, the British playwright. And uh, he felt that he was too heavy to play uh, Shylock. And so he went on a liquid protein diet that was supplemented by coffee and cigarettes. And in fact, he drank so much coffee that he was taken to the hospital with caffeine poisoning one day. So they were in Philadelphia at the Forest Theater. They were trying out the show and it was a three hour part that uh, that he had to get through. He did one matinee and he wasn't feeling well. So they took him to the hospital. Uh, he was in the hospital for a week. They thought perhaps it was the flu. He was getting better. And the following Saturday, he was being visited by Sam Levine, the, uh, the great star and great friend of Zero's and uh, Zero tried to get out of bed and he had a ruptured aorta, a heart attack, and he died in Sam Levine's arms on September 8th, 1977, at the age of 62. Last thing, uh, Jim, uh, what do you have uh, behind you? What are those pictures over your shoulder? The picture over my shoulder is Zero in Fiddler on the Roof. That hung in the front of the Schubert Theater in Los Angeles when Zero did the revival a fiddler, and when the Schubert Theater was torn down, I was there at the uh, the last party, like Follies, and they lined up all the artwork that had ever been in the theater, and that's the one I chose to take. Over my other shoulder is an original Zero Mostel that was done in 1960, and it's funny because there's a Roman theme that almost foreshadows a funny thing happened on the way to the Forum. So those are two of my great treasures to have Zero as uh, Tevye and an original Mostel. Yes, he was an original, and he and he would tell people that he was uh, that he was a painter who acts for paint money. That's right. He said, "I only do acting so I can buy more paint." Jim, thanks for sharing all these wonderful Zero Mostel stories. Ben, it was my pleasure to be here and to see you again anytime, my friend. I look forward to the next time uh, we can all travel safely. And when I'm in New York, we'll have some coffee. We'll talk some more about Zero and about your old friend, Robert Osborne. I'd love that. All right, everybody. Jim and I are done for the night, but stick around because coming up next, Professor Jacqueline Stewart will be here with Silent Sunday Night.